this point, I would like to introduce our next speaker, David Lobel. David is a professor at Stanford University in the Department of Earth System Science, and he's the Gloria and Richard Kuschel Director of the Center on Food Security and the Environment. The title of his talk is, Can Climate Smart Agriculture Deliver Food and Carbon Mitigation Solutions? Over to you, David. Um, so I am going to be addressing the agricultural side of the equation and just talked a lot about the forest. Um, and I should say, I guess, from the outset that th this is an area that I've, that I've done some research on in the past. I am not a, a, a soil expert um, like Francesca, but I have been teaching in this topic for a while. And, and what I want to focus on is, is just kind of what I take students through to some extent of, of really trying to get the numbers right on questions like this and understanding what really is the, the potential and also the trade-offs. And um, I was given this title by the organizers, I, I put a question mark on it, but uh, this term climate smart agriculture means a lot of different things to different people. Um, there's also a lot of uh, other terms out there. I think regenerative agriculture has also already been mentioned. Uh, for the purposes of today, I'll, I'll treat these all as equivalent. And basically we're talking about trying to build up carbon in agricultural systems as a way of, of providing uh, natural uh, managed carbon sink. Now I'll start with um, some of the, the reasons that I think there's, there's some optimism here. And, and I think this is reflected in, in to some extent in, in meetings like this. And one is that there is, is clearly growing interest both politically um, and commercially, and those go together obviously, but in a way that really we haven't seen at least in my say 20 years in the field. Um, the fact that say a lot of rural America um, is, is quite intrigued and interested in climate solutions is, is definitely not something to take lightly and not something to, um, to, to not try to, to take advantage of. We see, for example, with the commercial interest, um, what was already mentioned, uh, some of the commercial interests, this is an example of, of some California and initiatives that have been brought to my attention, some different foundations really interested in how much uh, regenerative agriculture in, in California can help. But on the commercial side, which was already mentioned, is Indigo Ag is really leading the way, at least in the US, in, in, in really talking big about how much you can get um, out of agriculture as a natural carbon sink. Uh, they've just raised, this, this is a recent article talking about their, um, their additional fund, uh, funding in, in recent times. And along with that announcement, they really were pushing this idea that, um, that agriculture really can be a big part of fighting global warming. In fact, they talk about a $15 trillion opportunity for farmers to fight climate change. And so you can maybe get some sense of why farmers are really paying attention when they're hearing numbers like this, especially when typical margins on, on, on uh, farms these days is, are very small and, and mostly through government uh, payments. So I'll come back to this in, in, in a little bit, but just to, to acknowledge that there is a very real money being directed at this and very real interest. Um, and at the same time, one of the longstanding, I think, uh, obstacles to thinking about this has been the, the fact that it's very difficult to monitor uh, compliance with any sort of uh, policy that is being incentivized or regulated. Um, it's just the transaction cost of monitoring thousands or even millions of farmers in some countries is, is incredibly difficult. But in, in many of these practices that are that are uh, and part of what people would consider climate smart, uh, many of these practices are increasingly easy to, to monitor. Uh, one example I'll put in is, is from work my group has done recently, just showing that uh, the practice of no-till or conservation tillage in the US is something that because of the, the signatures of, of plant residue on the surface, we can now do a fairly good job of mapping with satellites at, at subfield resolution the entire US. And we can do this year after year um, to understand both when farmers are um, and are not doing this practice. So you can look at permanence issues, um, reversibility um, at, at a very low cost. And so that is not unique to this particular practice, but it's um, there's a few practices where the cost of, of compliance or, or monitoring is, is getting much more uh, viable. Okay, but I want to spend most of my time today um, in the in the pessimistic side. I think I've I've you know I, I guess the um, the message here would be not necessarily that this shouldn't happen, but there are 
many reasons to be cautious and I just want to be uh, err on the side of being super clear about these these reasons to be cautious. One is that in agriculture, these are managed systems that first and foremost are going to be trying to to produce food. It's it's possible in some foreseeable future that they'll be primarily focused on the carbon revenues, but for the foreseeable future, this is going to be an additional revenue stream, not the main one. And and when push comes to shove, if there's things that need to be done to preserve their core business, these carbon gains are easily reversible. One I think good example of this is is now the um, the uh, concerns about weed resistance in the U.S. and not just in the U.S. but it's been um, it, certainly important here over the last decade, the increasing resistance to glyphosate of many, um, many important weeds, including Palmer amaranth, where the, the historically, uh, for the last 20 years, a lot of these weeds have been co controlled by chemicals, which has facilitated the um, adoption of no-till because tillage is historically one of the main ways we control weeds. As, as the resistance has built up, uh, many farmers have reverted back to tillage as a, as a in an effort to try to stem the, the rise of these, um, of these weeds. So things like this can, can easily happen, and, and that's true in, in, uh, in forests, I suppose, as well, that you can have single events that can, can reverse um, even decades of, of built-up carbon. So this is going to, I think, always be an issue, but, um, but is worth mentioning. Now, I think the key thing to understand here is the numbers in terms of, of what the impacts are relative to the claims that are being made. And I think there's just inevitably a lot of, um, of overselling of certain solutions. So let me walk you through at least my reasoning. And I'll use as an example, the Indigo Ag uh, example. They're, this is their advertisement here for their large carbon um, marketplace. They're saying that you potentially have about a $15. This is per ton of CO2 price. Okay, that's fine. They, they're they talking about potentially two to three credits per acre per year. Um, and so the revenue for a farmer would be something like 30 to $45 per acre per year, which is, which is a non-trivial amount of revenue if you're a farmer with um, hundreds of acres. The, uh, the star here is, is followed by a lot of small text, which I won't read at all, but which suffices to say that they're clear that this is for promotional purposes only and none of these numbers are they're going to be held to. But this is how they're coming up with statements like um, uh, 15 trillion dollars and in particular they're looking at something like two to three uh, metric tons of CO2 per acre per year which from as scientists we tend to think about hectares so this is something like on, on the order of five tons per hectare per year of carbon building up in the soil. Now, if you, want, if you kind of trace back to where statements like this derive from, an Indigo Ag is actually partnering with one of the main institutes that have been promoting uh, regenerative ag for a long time with statements like this, which is uh, you know, nothing if, if not clear, which is that uh, data from farming systems and pasture trials show uh, we could sequester more than 100% of all annual CO2 emissions from a switch to widely available and inexpensive management practices. So, this statement in, in turn is based on some calculations that have been done off of some studies. And this is a table from their, their, um, their uh, white paper that I, that I like to use, where you can see basically their calculation is they take some numbers in terms of tons per car of carbon per hectare per year, and then they, they just extrapolate to global cropland. And there's obviously issues with doing that. But I, I wanna focus today on mainly understanding where these numbers come from um, relative to like some of the studies that Francesca had mentioned. So these studies, if you look at all of these descriptions, um, in, encompass a lot of changes that are part of a package of, of say regenerative agriculture. But the thing that they all have in common, um, especially uh, these ones lift here, uh, listed here, is a very important role of uh, manure. And when you think about manure, there's a lot of um, a lot of issues with manure, but one of the primary ones is there's just not that much of it around. So if you look at these trials, for example, that are reporting something like four tons per hectare per year, which is again on the low side of what Indigo Ag is, is talking about, they're putting on 30 tons of manure uh, per hectare in, in, in these trials. So if you look at the total amount of manure in the world, and this is actually a, a, a homework problem in my class that um, students have the pleasure of, of going through and counting up all the animals in their, 
in their excretion rates. Um, you get uh, you get something like 600 million tons of manure that's not already accounted for in the current sort of inputs to to think of it as traditional agriculture. So you know most most farmers in most countries are recycling most of the nutrients, and this is the the you could think of this as like the feedlot manure, the 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 pig you know uh, lagoons that that need to be uh, they have problems disposing of all this manure in these centralized facilities, et cetera. There's costs obviously in recovering it, which is why it's not recovered now. But if, if you just look at the, the available nutrients, we're talking at something like 600 million tons that you could imagine activating at the current levels of, of livestock. Now you've got um, the simple math of dividing this out gives you something like 20 million hectares that you could cover with this surplus manure, let's call it. Uh, that is not a lot. So in, globally, we've got something like 1.5 billion hectares. So we're talking something on the order of 1% uh, crop area. And if you were able to do it on that 1% and you, and you accept this four tons per hectare, then you're talking about something on the order of a, of a gigaton if you do really well, but not something that's going to, quote, uh, offset all of the emissions in the world. Now, there are other issues with manure. Uh, in particular, whether it's you know, traditional livestock manure or what's often called green manure, where you're growing cover crops and then incorporating them into the soil, uh, there's a lot of nitrogen in that in, associated with that carbon. And studies have shown, and Francesca mentioned this, but if you look, for example, at a recent study um, looking just at green manures and trying to simulate what happens to the carbon flux, you do see uh, in this case, an uptake of carbon in the soils, but associated with that, you actually see uh, a very large increase in the amount of nitrous oxides coming off of these soils, which is more than enough to offset from a greenhouse gas perspective, the, um, the benefits in terms of, of carbon accrual. So notwithstanding all of the, all of the energy in, in terms of transporting manure, et cetera, there are very real benefits to soil fertility um, but in terms of net greenhouse gas savings, it, it's really not going to just be a carbon story. Um, and even if it were just a carbon story, it's not going to get you very far. So I think we're left largely thinking if we're, I think, being, you know, responsible, responsible accountants of the carbon fluxes and, and what's really being sequestered, we're left thinking about the non-manure inputs. Um, and this is uh, a big one is, is left is this no-till or conservation tillage. And, and actually, Francesca has already referenced this, this great uh, recent review. But I'm taking a different figure, which is instead of focused on the percent gains, um, looking at the actual metric tons per hectare per year from these practices. And when you look at that, you can see something well below one ton per hectare per year um, on, on average. And uh, they're looking both at no-till here and then reduced till, which which is having on average of almost no impact on the total uh, columns, column sum of, of the soil carbon buildup. As Francesca mentioned, you, you almost always get an increase in carbon in the very surface, but you typically associate with that also get a decrease lower down where you're not adding as many inputs because you're not tilling anymore. So again, this isn't to say that no-till does not have real benefits, uh, even from a carbon perspective, but they're not on the order of four or five tons per hectare that are going into a lot of these calculations. And, and so this is just to point out, even when you see a lot of kind of global uh, maps of what you can get out of regenerative agriculture or climate smart agriculture, they're typically look, showing you maps of what you get if you look at adding manure, uh, plus a few other things. And those few other things, um, like conservation tillage or agroforestry are not trivial in terms of, especially in certain locations, if, if for example, you're putting in trees into farming, you could, you could sequester a non-trivial amount of carbon in some places. But it's, uh, it's just important, I think, to understand that these are, are really not, uh, in my view, very credible assessments of what the net greenhouse gas gain is from these types, types of practices. So this, this figure has been shown, it's, it, there's actually two, there's a group, uh, Bill Schlesinger and, and a bunch of others um, led these analyses of, of both the global and the US potential. And so I, I believe Anne showed the, some, a figure from the, the US, this is the global version of that. But just to point out that studies that I think do a careful job, like including this one, they tend to find fairly low potent, mitigation potentials per 
per year from most agricultural options, especially if you're only looking in this case at the dark part of the bars, which are the low cost or things that they think would be feasible at, at reasonable um, carbon cost. And you can see that the, the biggest ones that emerge are actually biochar, which has been mentioned, um, planting trees and croplands, which I just mentioned, and then nutrient management. And this is really the, the big low cost one. And that's not a carbon story at all. That's really about reducing nitrous oxide emissions by better timing of fertilizer, um, uh, better, better uh, choice of how much to apply, et cetera. So I think that's really where, if you really want to think about climate smart agriculture, I think that's really where, um, where the, the focus is, is most deserved. Uh, now, the other, I think, reason to be pessimistic about it is, is I think, the, the real potential of things backfiring. And I mean that in a couple of ways. Um, and, and I mean that not, so maybe it's at least two ways, but I've already talked about the sort of biogeochemical backfiring of, of other of tr uh, trace gases coming from these practices. Um, but in, in this case, what I mean I, more so is, is that it can distract from, from real solutions. Um, and in particular, that it can, it can uh, distract from what I consider the main goal of agriculture, which is to, uh, to reduce the pressure on an, um, forest conversion and increase the possibilities for reforestation. And a lot of these practices, I think, run the risk of distracting from real productivity enhancing uh, practices. There was a recent uh, viewpoint that made this point quite strongly that the conservation in agriculture, which has been pushed a lot in tropical systems, is is has very marginal, if any, yield uh, en enhancement for these systems. And these are these are areas that are increasing populations rapidly. The food demand is increasing, and so if you are going to um, the the opportunity cost of focusing on things that aren't productivity improving, I think, is very much along the lines of, of increasing pressure on these. And so if you look at the best climate investments from an agricultural standpoint, I think we always have to come back uh, to the, whether, whether they're intended or not, to the uh, implications for the, the pressures on forest land. So I, I could say more about that, but I'll leave it at that for now and, and just summarize kind of what I think are the, the climate smart options that really deserve the, the most in, uh, attention with the recognition that none of these are going to be, uh, you know, enough to be more than say um, a couple of, of gigatons per year of, of abatement. Uh, but but number one is certainly the the nutrient management side of things, in, including the opportunities that are presented from new technologies to really reduce uh, the, the nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizer applications. Um, reducing pressures for land conversion. And I think there's a lot of opportunity. This is really more the area that I, that I work in more directly, but the, um, the, in, in particular, looking at closing yield gaps, trying to raise productivity in low yielding regions, um, trying to make sure that policies are in place to protect the uh, conversion. Uh, because if you Im improve local productivity without those policies in place, you often have perverse effects of, of increasing incentives to, to clear. And then, um, Improving soil quality is a big part of this, and I think that it's important from a productivity standpoint, particularly in these in these tropical regions, um, which may have some carbon benefits, but I don't think that that should be the the motivation for them. Now, um, one thing that that is related to that to some extent is is this use of biochar, and or what, what has been mentioned, enhanced weathering um, through through adding crushed uh, basalt or or olivine or other types of um, minerals to to the soil. And I think there's a lot of interest in this area now, and I, th I think it's it th certainly can scale in a way that, say, manure cannot to to be a um, a viable large scale uh, carbon sequestration approach. I think there's two big questions. One is the cost associated with these in terms of the getting the the bulk of of materials that you would need out to the farms. Um, for example, you know, Brazil had a massive effort to increase soil pH with, with a huge infrastructure investment. But in other places around the world where you've seen soil acidity be an issue for a very long time, they still haven't really been able to get a significant transport of, in this case, lime to fields just because of the, the, the cost of doing it. And, and it's not the lack of, of um, I think, 
appreciation of, of what the impact could be. So that we're in a similar situation here. But the other issue is, is, especially with some of these crushed rocks, is you introduce trace minerals, and to some extent biochar, if, if you're not careful, although it's less of an issue, um, you introduce potentially things like nickel and chromium that are not things you want in your food supply. And so there's, there's definitely real risk uh, to the soil that need to be explored. But this is, I, I would say, an area more deserving uh, of attention and investment um, if we're looking uh, for, for some level of, of offset in, in agricultural systems. Okay, great, thank you so much, Rob. Um, thank you for that balanced presentation. Um, just to remind everyone, please submit your questions through the chat. Um, I'm gonna actually start with the first one. Um, Rob, what do you think are the most important research opportunities going forward, especially in the areas of biochar or crushed rock? Do you have any specific research um, ideas that you think should be pursued? Um, I don't know, I may defer a little bit to Steve. I think he may talk about this a little bit, but you know, in, in my um, estimation, the, the, oppor the, the interesting opportunity from my standpoint is, this, is the situations in where you have sort of a double benefit of these additions. So I mentioned the, the pH problem in a lot of tropical soils, which really reduces um, uh, nutrient availability and plant productivity. Some of these things like basalt can actually increase the pH the same way lime does, but in a way that actually is building up carbon as opposed to, um, in the case of lime, arguably releasing carbon. So I think trying to look for those, um, those areas where you get multiple benefits from these additions was going to make the economics much more attractive and also potentially make the carbon benefits, if you think of the whole system, much more attractive. So, it, you know, again, I think it's, it's, it's not an area that, that is very mature, nor one that I work in, but that would be, I think, the, the area I would focus. Okay, also you. in tropical systems, you, the enhanced weathering effects tend to be higher because of the, the high temperature. So you can, you, there's a carbon argument to, to focus in those systems as well. Okay, Jenny, what additional questions do you have from the audience? Okay, great. Thank you, David. Uh, nice presentation. So we have a couple of questions and uh, we'll start with Andrew Robertson. Andrew, can you unmute yourself when you're able to and ask your question, please? Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I had, thanks for your presentation, David. Uh, I had a question quite generally around the sort of pessimism story, I guess, as a whole. Um, that do you, do you not think that regenerative agriculture or um, agricultural you know, MBS as a whole is one of those low hanging fruit that we can get going with quickly. I, I completely agree with you that a lot of the claims coming out from Indigo and others are ridiculous. There's no way that they can reach that level of sustained carbon gains. But if you compare the agricultural MBS sector to things like uh, reforestation, it's cheaper, it's faster, and we can, it doesn't require land use change. So we should really be targeting those things and recognize that, you know, if we want to get things going quickly, there's no silver bullet for MBS. So shouldn't we be tackling agriculture still? I mean, to me, it's, it's as much a, a political economy question as anything. Like if you can get the buy-in of rural communities around the world, especially in this country, um, by pursuing this in a way that creates the, um, the momentum to actually make progress on the fossil fuel question, uh, then by all means, I, you know, I couldn't care less how much carbon it builds up if that's the political view of things. But, but as a scientist, if I look at these, I, I, I view it um, as like, for example, if we're gonna put a lot of resources into conservation tillage and no tillage, um, you have to think about all the other things, even from an agricultural standpoint, that you're not pushing, because because you know typically you're you're able to promote one or two practice changes at a time, and and I'm thinking more in the context of the types of systems I work around the world. So I'm not opposed to the idea of, you know, I don't think there's a lot of harm done from say promoting um, no-till, but I really would be hesitant to call it a low-hanging fruit if, if it's a, you know, if it's, I think somebody uh, mentioned kumquats before, but, you know, it depends on the size of the fruit. Like, it might be low-hanging, but it's, it's, you know, it's a grape. It's not a grapefruit. So, uh, low-hanging, yes, relative to forestry, but not a very big fruit. Thank you. Um, thanks, David, for your answer there. Um, we have a follow-up question from Claire Jams. Claire, would you like to ask your question? Unmute yourself when you're able. 
Hi, thanks. Um, thanks for your presentation. And I have to say, I too have been suspicious of indigos two to three tons per acre. So I asked them and read the protocol that's on CAR. And in fact, it does include all the other things that you say could happen, right? So it includes everything from reducing nitrogen emissions to fossil fuel switching to renewables on farms. So I think that's where they get that from. And I do agree that that's important to recognize and be really clear about because if we don't, I guess if we don't really recognize this and pull apart, you know, what is an emission reduction versus what is a marginal carbon sequestration, it's really hard for policymakers to move forward, right? And so I think maybe part of the problem is all of this work has developed in an offset space. So obviously folks want the offset credit to be as large as possible. <laughs> um, and meanwhile, they're working in sectors that have not been regulated for emission reduction. So I guess I'm just wondering from a policy perspective, is it maybe more helpful to look at that kind of all in operation wide approach that Indigo is doing, as opposed to trying to credit sort of each individual practice separately? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I don't claim to know, uh, like from a marketing standpoint, what works. I think you're, you're right that really what matters in these systems is sort of the, the totality of their, of their system and the energy use and the greenhouse gases associated with it. Um, you know, I've just, I guess I've been around long enough that, that I've seen the eventual blowback against false promises. And, and I think the, um, the, the real risk that, you know, there's another decade spent pursuing things that actually in the end don't add up to, to very much. So I guess that's my, my bias, but I, it's not to, um, again, as I, as I said to the prior question, it's not to say that I say other than the opportunity cost that I see any, any big harm of these types of practices. I just think the, when it comes down to really setting up rigorous sort of accounting mechanisms to account for this carbon, that there's going to be a, a lot of um, a lot of disappointment and a lot of uh, kind of I, I don't know regrets of not pursuing maybe some more difficult but more um, scalable solutions. But you know, I think they're again like I'm not a I, I'm not saying that they don't have a, a path towards other like maybe rock weathering is on the, like it's not, it's not to say that they're constraining themselves to these practices, but I just think that um, the, the overall potential is going to be much lower.